my name's Tilly. I'm one of the final year medical students at Bart's. Um, I'm doing the PALS talk today on a section of obstetrics. I'm going to come off of the video now. I just wanted to show my face and say hi and go on to the main PowerPoint. I've got my email address on here. Um, if you've got any questions or if you think anything doesn't look quite right on the slides, I'd appreciate if you could let me know. Okay, so today I'll be covering three main sections. The first is subfertility. Then I'll go on to antenatal care, and that's divided into two sections. And finally, we'll finish with termination of pregnancy. So starting with subfertility. Subfertility is the inability to achieve pregnancy after 12 months of regular unprotected intercourse. And that's a definition given by both the WHO and the NHS. Subfertility is fairly common, but with regular intercourse, and it regular is defined as about every two to three days, 84% of couples will conceive within a year, and 92% of couples within two years. Investigations begin after a year of trying, but this is earlier if the female is 36 or above, or if there are any other problems that might affect fertility, so such as pelvic inflammatory disease or cancer treatment. Diagnosis is normally after a year, and it can be primary or secondary. So primary is where neither partner has conceived previously, and it is now having difficulties. Whereas secondary is where one, one of the partners has previously conceived, but they're now having difficulties. And there are some generic risks, so smoking, obesity, occupational risks like um, chefs with overheating, excessive alcohol consumption, drug use, and female fertility generally declines with age. Um, and I think the evidence is still to be shown with males whether it decreases with age. So with any subfertility concerns, obviously investigation should be done for both partners. And you start with the full history. So that would include previous pregnancies and the outcomes of those pregnancies, frequency of sex, duration, and any difficulties when contraception stopped, and also full medical and surgical history, and that should include STDs, especially chlamydia. Lifestyle factors impact fertility, and we'll talk about those in a minute, and then mental health, so particularly common would be stress. Next, um, an examination, and that would only be done if the history um, recommended it. So height and weight for BMI, appearance, so acne or hirsutism, and bimanual, bimanual examination, or testicle examination. Next would be tests, so blood tests in females, you might do progesterone if they, if they have regular periods, or gonadotrophin, so luteinizing hormone, LH, or follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, if their periods are irregular. For both male and females, you test things like thyroid function and prolactin. And you do chlamydia testing for both as well. Specialist tests would be done in secondary care. For females, this would involve imaging and males would be sperm analysis. But I'll talk about these a bit later on in the PowerPoint slides. So if we look at causes, this is just a summary of causes and I'll go into each one. So if we start with female, we've got ovulatory disorders, tubal factors and uterine factors, male causes, and then finally unexplained causes, which make up about 28%. So start with ovulatory disorders. So according to the WHO, ovulatory disorders can be classified into three main categories, groups one, two, and three. The most common is group two, which makes up about 85%. Group 1, making up about 10%, is hypothalamic pituitary failure, and this is where there's a problem with either the hypothalamus or the pituitary. Group 2, this is more to do with the axis, so hypothalamic pituitary ovary dysfunction, and on the right hand side is an image of the axis there, so hypothalamus releasing GnRH, stimulating the pituitary to release gonadotrophins FSH and LH, which then work on the ovary to release estradiol and progesterone. And it's these, estradiol and progesterone, that then feed back and modify 
output from the hypothalamus and pituitary, which can be either positive or negative feedback. And then finally, group three is ovarian failure, and this is where the pathology is within the ovaries. So starting with group one, so this is a hypothalamus and pituitary. This can be further categorised into two main groups. That is hypogonadism, hypogonad or HH, and hypothalamic amenorrhea, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So there are lots of causes of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, but overall it's either a result of hypothalamic or pituitary failure or dysfunction. And they ultimately result in decreased FSH and LH secretion. So HH can be hypothalamic, so Kalman syndrome, where you have amenorrhea and anosmia. Structural, so a tumour in the hypothalamus. Any radiotherapy or surgery to that area can obviously impact the hypothalamus or the pituitary. And then idiopathic causes, where we, we don't know what the underlying cause is. Kalman syndrome is a genetic disorder and it prevents the initiation or completion of puberty and it's because of a lack of GnRH released by the hypothalamus. Sheehan syndrome, which is under the pituitary section, is panhypopituitarism, which is typically occurs after an infarction, such as um, after postpartum haemorrhage. Also under pituitary, you can have pituitary tumours, so prolactinomas or craniopharyngiomas. Craniopharyngioma is a tumour that grows in the pituitary stalk, and prolactinoma makes too much prolactin, and it results in headaches, visual field defects, menstrual disturbance, and it's, it can be measured by prolactin levels in serum. And treatment would depend on the cause for all of these, so it might be surgery or with a prolactinoma, dopamine agonists like bromocriptine or cobergoline. But all of them are likely to respond to gonadotrophin ovulation induction, providing there isn't any pathology within the ovaries as well. So that would be giving FSH and LH. And then there's this thing called GnRH pulsatile therapy. And this is where GnRH is released in a pulsatile manner. And that emulates a natural GnRH pulse. That's thought to be beneficial because it reduces multiple follicle recruitment, which means you're less likely to get multiple pregnancies and ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which are both side effects of FSH and LH. GnRH pulsatile therapy, I don't think is very widespread on the NHS. I couldn't find very much about it and it seems like it's quite costly, so I imagine that's the reason. And then finally, as with all subfertility, well, with most subfertility, um, you can have IVF treatment, which I'll talk about later as well. So hypothalamic amenorrhea, also within group one. So this is where there isn't anything structurally wrong with the hypothalamus, but it's a functional disorder. It tends to be a result of amenorrhea caused by low body weight or specifically low fat, excess exercise or stress. And all of these things switch it off. It's seen in athletes, ballet dancers, people who compete in competitive sport. And symptoms include signs of oestrogen deficiency, so for example vaginal dryness or small uterus on scan. It shows some similarities with PCOS, which it comes under group two, and I'll talk about that in subsequent slides. But I've just put a little table here on the right to compare PCOS with hypothalamic amenorrhea, some of the similarities and differences. So periods are affected in both, but with HA that you tend to have amenorrhea, whereas with PCOS you tend to have oligomenorrhea. HA, multicystic ovaries, whereas PCOS tends to have polycystic. And there are differences in the follicles, although both of them are multi obviously multiple cysts in terms of the location and variation in size. PCOS, you are more likely to see hirsutism and acne. And with PCOS, you would see, or you're more likely to see high LH and low FSH, whereas with HA, you would see low or normal levels of both. Then this picture, I just wanted to um, show this 
lady, um, and oh, I, terribly, I've forgotten her name. But, um, but she's a model and also has PCOS. So on to group two. So this is where there's a problem with the axis. And this group's mainly made up of patients with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I'll go on to these in the next slide. I just want to summarise the other three quickly. Um, so these three are more uh, or much rarer causes. And androgen secreting tumours. And the and uh, androgens that are released antagonise oestrogens at the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the ovary. And for example, in Cushing's patients, 50% have polycystic ovaries. And you might suspect an androgen secreting tumour if you saw things like hoarse voice, clitoromegaly, male muscle distribution, and especially if those were fairly rapid and of recent onset. But PCOS is the most common in this group, so I'll go on to that now. So polycystic ovarian syndrome is a heterogeneous condition, so there isn't one specific diagnostic feature, more it's a combination of features. And the list here just shows a few of those. So an or oligo ovulation, which tends to present as an or oligomenorrhea, central obesity, hyperandrogenism, which would show possibly as hirsutism or acne. You often see raised LH and low FSH. And that's because the excess oestrogen in PCOS inhibits FSH. And you see polycystic ovaries on the scan, which I'll show on the next image. And that's a very common finding. And again, this is a, the wonderful model. Um, but yeah, I can't remember her name. I know. Okay, so one of the criteria to help diagnose PCOS is called the Rotterdam Consensus. And you need two out of three. And um, those are those three detailed on the left. And this consensus um, assumes that less common hormonal pathologies have been excluded before you go down this path. So the first is oligo or anovulation. Second, cyclical hyperandrogenism, so hirsutism or acne. Or it can be from biochemical tests, so for example, increased testosterone. And the third, polycystic ovaries. That can be in one or both, unilateral or bilateral. And that's on pelvic ultrasound scan. And these images just show some polycystic ovaries. So on the top left is a normal ovary. On the right is a polycystic ovary. And you can see that big dark shadow is much bigger, so the ovary is bigger. And you can also see those cysts throughout the ovary. The bottom two images are the same picture, but on the right we've uh, just put on outlines so you can see where those cysts are. And polycystic ovaries would be defined as 12 or more antral follicles. There are risks associated with PCOS in the long term. Endometrial hyperplasia is one of them, and that can predispose to endometrial cancer. And there's a link between PCOS and insulin resistance. In terms of treatment, there are a few options. So the first would be lifestyle, losing weight, and even a 5 to 10 percent reduction in weight can be effective. A medical treatment is clomiphene citrate, and this would be the fit primary treatment. This blocks the oestrogen receptors in the pituitary. This blocks that negative feedback, and that results in the release of FSH, which can then go on to stimulate the ovaries. An example of treatment would be 50 milligrams of clomiphene for five days from the second or third day of the natural period or medication-induced withdrawal bleed. An ovulation is typically seven days after the last tablet. Clomiphene has some risks associated with it. So there's an increased risk of ovarian cancer if it's taken for more than 12 months. And so six cycles are normally the maximum that's allowed or recommended. It risks multiple pregnancies and OHSS. And that's the same with any of the ovary stimulating medications or treatments. 
Metformin is another treatment, although um, it's used off license. If neither work, an epitrophin ovulation induction can be used. So this is where you would give exogenous FSH. And again, as I said, you would risk multiple pregnancies and OHSS. And finally, this image on the right just shows laparoscopic ovarian drilling. And it's, it's as it looks. Uh, diathermy is used to drill into the ovary. You can just see a couple of lesions there where that's been done. And as far as I can tell, the mechanism's unclear, but it's thought to reduce the size of enlarged ovaries and reduce androgen secretions. Oh, sorry about that. I've, uh, I've left off notes on that. Let's skip on to uh, group three, which is ovarian failure, so a problem with the ovaries themselves. So sorry, this is another big list um, of causes. I'll just go through some of them. So you can have primary ovarian insufficiency, also known as premature menopause or premature ovarian failure. And this is because of a diminished ovarian reserve. It can be idiopathic. If you've had your ovaries taken out, so hysterectomy. Any chemotherapy or radiation, radiotherapy in the pelvis can obviously damage the structures around there, including the ovaries. It can be ge uh, genetic, so chromosomal disorders such as Turner syndrome. And these two women here are famous, once a famous 90s gymnast who had Turner's and the lady on the right, a current actress who also has Turner's. In terms of um, investigations, you can measure FSH and LH. So if there are a few eggs in the body, it will push harder to try and release the remaining eggs. And the way it does that is by releasing more and more FSH and LH. And in terms of treatment, because this is complete ovarian failure, the only treatment would be egg donation and IVF. And I do have the names of these two ladies. It is um, Missy Marlowe is the gymnast on the left and Linda Hunt, the actress on the right. So on to the second group, which is tubal factors. And these make up 20% of cases of subfertility. So fallopian tubes are really delicate and there's lots of ways to injure them. This, info, this slide's got a lot of info on it, but I thought it summarised all of those types of damage quite nicely. I've taken it from the RGOC or RCOG um, e-learning page. And just a few examples on there. So endometriosis, ectopic pregnancies, obviously surgery, so adhesions. And the most common cause of tube damage is caused often by chlamydia in pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. So it may be that the tubes are completely blocked, or they might just not be working very well. And, not, and if they're not working well, they can't push the egg through. And indeed, with ectopic pregnancy, that can be the case, so that the tube isn't able to push a fertilised egg, and so the egg gets stuck in the tube. They can have peritubal adhesions, which I mentioned uh, just a second ago, and it can be caused, for example, by PID. And tubal damage is a common sequelae of PID, and incidence is proportional to the number of episodes. So the more, more PID, the more likely to have tubal damage. Blockage can be at different places in the tube, so it can be proximal, mid-tubal, or distal. And something that's quite important with tubal factors is hydrosalpinks. And this is where the tube's blocked and then it fills with a clear fluid. And these blockages tend to be near the ovaries and they cause a big distended tube. And I'll show a picture of that in a minute. So hydrosalpinx is important in itself as a pathology, but it can also leak out, the fluid of it can leak out and ruin IVF pregnancies. And so before IVF is undergone, we'd advise patients to have hydrosalpinx removed. A hematosalpinx is a blood-filled tube and a pyosalpinx is a pus-filled tube. And I'll talk about investigations um, and treatments in a moment. Oh, no, I'll talk about them now. <laughs> so investigations. Uh, so there are lots of imaging techniques you can use to look at both the fallopian tubes and the uterus. The first one would be transvaginal ultrasound. So this only tends to be useful if there's very severe hydrosalpinx. Hysterosalpingogram, or an HSG, 
In this technique, which you can see an image of on the right hand side, that black and white image, contrast mediums injected into the uterine cavity through the cervical canal and then x-rays are taken of the pelvis. You can see on there the uter uterus anatomy and also tubal patency. So if the contrast fluid didn't go through, you wouldn't see the rest of the tube. And you only do this once the patient's uh, diagnosed as chlamydia negative and they've been given prophylactic azithromycin. And so in this image on the right, the one that's got HSG on the top, in the centre of the image, you can hopefully see the uterus there just folded. And then coming off to the right are the fallopian tubes on both sides. And then as you sort of go vertically, you can see there two really big hydrocell pinks. So the next technique is called HICOSI, and that stands for Hysterosalpingo Contrast Sonography. <laughs> um, again, it uses a contrast medium, but instead of x-rays, you use ultrasound. It's an alternative to HSG, and it's very similar to what I've just described for HSG. Hysteroscopy. So an endoscope, an endoscope is passed through the cervix into the uterus, and it's considered a gold standard technique because you can get direct visualisation of the uterine cavity and you can also potentially treat whilst you're there. This picture shows hysteroscopy and it's you can see the sort of fuzzy pink white uterus and then that hole is the right ostia that's leading into the right fallopian tube. Salpingography or phalloscopy, so salpingography is an x-ray that's focused on the tubes and a phalloscopy is a microendoscope that's passed further right into the fallopian tubes. The final technique is called laparoscopic dye and hydrotubation, or abbreviated to lap dye. And again, this is another gold standard technique. In this technique, methylene blue dye is injected through the cervix. And at the same time, the tubes are viewed from within the abdomen via a laparoscope. And in this way, you're viewing the tubes from the outside. And so any dye that leaks through the tubes can be seen. And so in that way, the blue dye highlights area of damage or areas of damage. And so you can see on this picture, you, on the top right is a right ovary and the top left is a left ovary just to orientate. And then as you come down, you can just see both on the right and the left, particularly on the left hand side, there's quite a lot of blue dye. And that's indicating that on the tubes there, there must be um, a point of damage where that dye is leaking out from. And you can just about see it on the right hand side as well. So because this involves a laparoscopy, you would only do it if you had another reason for doing the laparoscopy, or if you had a strong suspicion that there was a tubal abnormality. Otherwise, it's second line after HSG or HICOSI, and only if they are abnormal. And the advantage of this technique is obviously because you're already in the abdomen, um, or pelvis, you can treat any pathology there. Some treatments for tubal and uterine factors are tubal surgery. Is it, sorry, this is uh, that's wrong, that title should just say tubal factors. So tubal surgery, um, so this is when you go in and directly operate on the tubes. So you could have a salpingostomy, which is the creation of an opening, for example, if you needed to drain. A salpingectomy, which is complete removal of the tubes. I put tubal ligation in here as well, um, and this is when people talk about having their tubes tied. This can be done with clips, cautery, or bands, and it's considered a permanent and irreversible form of contraception. So um, just in terms of tubes being tied, they can't be untied. And aspiration of hydrosalpinxes. This is really important because hydrosalpinx um, risks a future ectopic pregnancy. So this is especially important as well for IVF. Tubal catheterization is the next technique. Um, this is where tubes that were closed due to occlusion are reopened or tried to be reopened. And this can be done with catheters, guide wires and or balloons. And then finally we come again to IVF. And this tends to be done for moderate to severe tubal disease and all bilateral disease. And rates of surgery have been decreasing recently because IVF has been found to be more effective than going in and surgically managing tubes. 
So that brings us to the end of tubal factors. Now on to uterine factors. So uterine factors are, tend to be more anatomical. So there's a little list there, fibroids, polyps, adhesions, or congenital abnormalities. And you can see in this image here, the ultrasound picture of the uterus, that there's a big scepter that's just pointing right into the centre of the uterus. So that would, that would be negative for any pregnancy, implantation or growth. And treatment for these uterine factors is normally surgical. On to male factors that make up about 30% of subfertility cases. So, sorry, this is, this is just a big list. I'm just going to summarise a couple of things on here. So, in general, most causes of male subfertility are unknown. But aside from those unknown ones, there are four main categories. The first would be testicular cancer, and particularly testicular germ cell tumours, or TGCTs. And its semen quality tends to decrease before the TGCT is even diagnosed. And the second is pretesticular causes. And this would be hypothalamic pituitary disease. So there are many causes of this, and this is a similar category to group one that we saw earlier in females. The third is testicular causes. So again, there are many in this. So this includes lifestyle things like um, hot testicles, for example, if you're uh, working in a hot environment occupationally, or smoking. Some medications interfere with, interfere with sperm production, so for example sulfasalazine, anabolic steroids, obviously chemotherapy, and also some herbal remedies and over-the-counter treatments. So there's a herbal remedy that's particularly um, unhelpful with fertility, and I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it is on there. Others are genetic, so for example Kleinfelter syndrome, where there are no germ cells. Infections, such as mumps in particular. And systemic disorders like cirrhosis, malnutrition, or celiac disease. And finally, post testicular, which tend to be problems with transport. So these would include cystic fibrosis, epididymis, and defective ejaculation. For example, retrograde ejaculation where sperm passes back into the bladder. Investigations. So, as with females, you would take a full history examination if that was appropriate. You then go on to specialist testing which would be done in secondary care and that would be semen analysis. And on the right here is a table just showing the WHO guidelines for different measurements and their ranges. The lower reference limit which is this main, the column on the right, the main number there, that isn't a cutoff as such, that's the fifth percentile for these different characteristics the cutoffs are the ranges that are to the right of that. I'm not sure why they put that in the table. I find it a bit confusing, but that's what it is. So before taking samples, um, we should be aware that they should be collected two to seven days after sexual abstinence. A confirmatory test is ideally done three months afterwards, and that allows the cycle of spermatozoa to be completed. And it means leaving 90 days before you retest anybody. No anabolic steroids or the medications that I mentioned before, they'd all need to be stopped. And the lifestyle things like um, temperature, lots of cycling, lots of protein shakes, these sorts of things aren't supposed to be good for sperm. And a BMI of 30 tends not to be treated on the NHS, so weight loss might also be a factor there. I've got this little video in because I thought it was... Um, just quite interesting. <laughs> mm. Although I don't think you can hear that. Let's see if my sound is turned up. Oh. Okay, fine, no sound, but you can see there, there's, these are healthy sperm and they're at about the right concentration. Try again, okay.
This specimen shows fluid sperm death and fluid progressive neutral. Okay, here we go, the picture. So, in terms of diagnosis, um, semen analysis helps to, helps to give us that diagnosis. And the table on the right here shows some terminology that's used. So things like reduction in mobility, concentration, whether they're a normal shape or not. And the most common diagnosis is on the left in blue, and that's oligoterato-asthenospermia, or OAT. And using the table on the right, we can just see that that means a reduced concentration, motility, and percentage of sperm that have a normal shape. So that's the most common diagnosis, OAT. If the semen analysis shows severe oligospermia or azospermia, you test FSH, LH and testosterone and estradiol levels, and that helped to just explore what was going on underneath. And the table here uh, just sort of summarises some of those results. So, for example, if you see low FSH, high testosterone, you might consider there's been some anabolic steroid abuse. But I, that table's just for reference, really. In terms of treatment, so not so long ago, denial was the most frequent approach, and it was assumed to be a female problem. But obviously, we moved on from those days, and we look more at things like lifestyle, so smoking cessation, occupation, are patients exposed to toxins, heavy metals, that sort of thing. You can use medical treatments, so if patients have infections, treating with antibiotics, and also stopping medications that I mentioned before, like sulfasalazine, that negatively impact on sperm production. Surgery, so epididymal, epididymal blockage, you can surgically correct. And finally, as with all of these things, you can go to IVF ultimately. And particularly for male causes of subfertility, you might look at, um, if, it, if there's an, a problem with sperm, you might look at intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or ICSI, which I'll talk about a bit more later on. You can use donor insemination, and IUI, which is intrauterine insemination, isn't recommended if, for example, there's a problem with the sperm. On to unexplained causes. So this is largely a diagnosis of exclusion, but there is some evidence for causes that might be contributing. So subclinical endometriosis, undiagnosed or untreated celiac disease is hypothesized to be a cause for some women, and poor ovarian reserve. So assisted reproductive techniques or ART, and this is what IVF comes under, there are three different um, types or things that I want to just mention, and that's intrauterine insemination, or IUI. This can be done with or without ovarian stimulation. And it's when sperm is inseminated straight into the uterus. It's used for unexplained fertility, mild ma male factors, mild endometriosis. And if you use ovarian stimulation, as with all treatments that stimulate the ovaries, you risk multiple pregnancies and... OHSS. Intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or ICSI, is really um, a technique used within IVF, and that's where sperm is directly injected into an ovum. It improves the fertilisation rate, but it's thought that the pregnancy rate that results in live births is actually unchanged, compared to IVF that doesn't use ICSI. But it's used for unexplained subfertility if the first cycle fails, used for male factors, and also if the patients have had IVF done before and it doesn't work, ICSI can then be used. So I've just got a little video, and hopefully this one will work a bit better. So 
got this ICSI, and you can see that the sperm's literally directly injected into the egg. Oh. Okay, so uh, IVF, I'll talk about that on the next slide because it needs a bit more detail. So at the moment in the NHS, IVF is offered if patients have failed to conceive after regular unprotected sex for two years, and that includes one year of regular unprotected sex prior to treatment. A number of diagnoses warrant IVF treatment, and I won't list all of them, but you can see a list of them there. So for example, male factor, ovulatory disorders, and particularly where pre-implantation genetic screening or diagnosis is needed. Obviously IVF is then needed. Before you undertake IVF, a number of factors are required. And again, they're all listed there. Ovarian reserve testing right at the bottom is probably one of the most important things. And that helps to determine whether the ovaries are likely to even respond to treatment and whether they're likely to produce eggs. So there's a couple of things that are used for ovarian reserve testing. The first is the woman's age. It's used as a predictor. And Tests that can be done are total antral follicle count, so literally testing the follicles, anti-malarian hormone, which decreases with well, decreases over time and isn't present post-menopause, and FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. This table on the right, uh, which just shows success rates, and you can see from that that as the age of the woman increases, the success rate drastically decreases until after 45 years it's only a 2% success rate. It's worth saying that this, these rates relate to women who've used their own eggs, and it doesn't relate to women that use donor eggs or eggs that they've frozen at a younger age. One in six IVF births are multiple, and the numbers have come down over time. That, was, that result was obviously a long time ago, 2013, and I suspect it's a lot less now. And, but back in, these babies were born a, quite a while ago. So the picture on the top left, this is the Chikwu family in Houston, Texas. And those babies were born in 1998. And there were eight of them born initially. Well, eight of them born and unfortunately one of them passed away. And then on the right hand side, this is the Suleiman Octomum. And those are her eight babies and they were born in 2009. So multiple embryo implantation isn't something that's done in the UK anymore. And I believe the maximum that can be implanted is three. And that's only if the patient fulfills very specific criteria. With IVF, obviously, if you implant multiple embryos, you have a risk of multiple pregnancies. You're stimulating the ovaries, so you have that risk of OHSS. All of the operative complications, so bleeding, infection. And as well as that, IVF babies tend to have a right, higher risk of preterm birth, just being born early, and also low birth weight. But interestingly, that low birth weight is decreased in babies where the embryos were frozen first. And I, I don't think, uh, I couldn't find anything to say why that is the case. Okay, so this is just um, two summary slides now. So this is a summary of investigations. So both partners, a full history, examination, blood tests, chlamydia testing, and then special testing, which for females tends to be imaging, and for males tends to be male sperm analysis. And again, just a summary of treatments to tie it all together. First being lifestyle, so particularly for hypothalamic amenorrhea, PCOS and male factors. So this is things like um, altering your weight, increasing or losing weight, depending on where you sit on the BMI scale. Occupational, so again, if men are exposed to heat or toxins. You've got some medical treatments, so particularly for PCOS, clomiphene and metformin. And then for ovulatory disorders, groups one and two, gonadotrophins or GnRH therapy. Surgical for tubes and uterine pathology and also in men for things like epididymal blockage. And then finally assistive conception which would be IVF or insemination and within IVF is ICSI or the sperm injection. 
moving on from subfertility onto antenatal care. I'm going to start with principles of antenatal care, just give an outline, and then move on to specific screening programmes within the antenatal care that we have in the NHS. So I looked around for resources that could really nicely summarise antenatal care and all of the tests that we do, but there's so much within it I couldn't find one nice image. And the best resource I could find was actually the NHS CKS pathway or flowchart, which I've put here. And I'll put a reference for this um, at the end, so that if you do want to have a look, you can find it. And I like that it was just simply broken down into each of the components that make up antenatal care. So for example, principles of care, which is at the top in the centre there, or planning the place of birth, or on the right, bottom right, you've got screening, schedules of appointments. So I thought this was, qu this was quite a nice summary of what goes on in UK antenatal care. So just to start, principles of care. So antenatal care should be woman-centred. So this just means that women should be the focus and they should be given choice, easy access and continuity of care if possible. And the whole point of it is to enable women to make informed decisions. And those decisions should be respected even when it's contrary to the views of the healthcare practitioner. Ideally, the setting in which antenatal appointments take place should be comfortable and open and allow women to talk about things that might be challenging, domestic violence, sexual abuse, FGM, drug abuse, that sort of thing. And antenatal care also needs to be sensitive to the beliefs of the woman and the local community. The next principle is to help um, the women and practitioners make a birth plan. The next to advise and educate on what normal symptoms of pregnancy are and what women can expect. Finally would be to assess the mother and the foetus for well-being throughout pregnancy. And the idea of this is to identify risks that may cause complications and make things difficult. And this is done first of all by identifying those risks but then assigning women to a care pathway and I'll talk about those care pathways in a moment. And, sorry, this is, this is the final one, and that is that um, when women are being referred from, for example, midwife care to obstetrician care, there should be clear and simple referral pathways. So those are a summary of the principles of antenatal care. And I mentioned risks. So, in general, antenatal care involves multidisciplinary teams and different types of carers. So that includes GPs, community midwives, hospital midwives, obstetricians, social workers, even physiotherapists. And as I just mentioned, women are assigned into one of two pathways, and those two pathways are here. The first being routine or low chance antenatal care pathway, and the second being high chance antenatal care pathway, which means there are potentially more complications and more risks. And each pathway has a different mix of appointments and members of the team. So this low chance antenatal pathway, which is the uncomplicated pathway, is led largely by midwives and GPs. But obviously, as I mentioned before, with those clear referral pathways, if problems do arise. For singleton pregnancies, most women are un uncomplicated and they deliver a healthy infant with very little medical intervention. And thus they would be in this pathway. If the woman hasn't been pregnant before, she'd have 10 appointments, so that's just shown in that left purple box. If she has been pregnant before, she'll have seven appointments, which is quite a lot of appointments, really. And this is just the basic set of appointments as well. There are more appointments that are added on top of this, which I'll talk about in a minute. High chance antenatal care pathway. This involves specialist teams, and particularly obstetricians. The reason that obstetricians are only normally involved in this high chance antenatal care pathway is that the evidence shows that routine involvement of obstetricians at scheduled times doesn't improve outcomes. So this is a slide that just summarises risks that might mean a mother is put into that higher risk pathway of care. I'm not going to go over them as another talker um, or another person sorry, has talked about um, maternal medicine. 
but just examples are very young or old um, when pregnant or mothers that have got autoimmune conditions or have had previously preterm births. So on to all the appointments and tests that can be done as part of antenatal care. And again, I tried to look for a really simple summary of this. And this was the most simple one I could find. And it's still completely full of information. So I just put that up there to show that there's a lot that goes on in pregnancy um, and too many appointments for me to simplify it into just one slide. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about it over a couple of slides. So back to this NHS flowchart. And in the bottom right was that schedule of appointments. And that showed this, that's on the left-hand side. So as I mentioned, in normal pregnancies, for those on the low-risk pathway, there's 10 appointments in nulliparous women. And those appointments are here. The initial appointment is to facilitate planning of both the immediate antenatal care and to formulate a plan for all of antenatal care and through to birth. It's a really thorough appointment, and so it's sometimes broken down into two separate appointments. And that is first contact and then the booking appointment. So first contact is normally when the, the woman first comes in, for example, to see the GP to tell them that she's pregnant. And the booking appointment is normally done with the community with midwife, and this is when lots of details are talked through. So I'm going to talk about each of these two appointments in two separate slides now. There's lo loads of information, so I won't go over all of it, but this is just a summary. And so, because they're really thorough, they cover lots and lots of things. But the main thing is to take, or the first thing, is to take full medical, obstetric and surgical history. Advice is then given. So, for example, nutritional advice. This would include advice about folic acid supplementation should occur before conception all the way through to 12 weeks. Obviously this isn't possible if they've already presented pregnant. Vitamin A supplementation for example may be teratogenic at high levels. This should be avoided. And food hygiene advice. For example listeriosis which you can get from unpasteurized milk or soft cheese. Also pate and uncooked meat. Sorry uncooked ready meals. Uh, salmonella which you can get from uncooked meat, especially poultry and raw eggs. Alcohol. I believe the current advice is ideally no alcohol at all, but the more you drink, the greater the risk to harming the baby. And alcohol can lead to fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And the severity and nature of these are linked to the age of the fetus at the time, the developmental stage and the amount that the mother has drunk. And they include things like fetal alcohol syndrome or FAS or FASD. Medicines. Because of the reality of testing medication on pregnant women, very few medicines have been tested and approved as safe during pregnancy. And so the best advice is probably to just use as little as possible. And that includes over-the-counter medications. It also includes complementary therapies, just because I'm sure very few have been tested to see whether they're safe and effective. It's best not to assume that they are. Exercise. So beginning or continuing moderate exercise isn't associated with adverse effects, but obviously certain exercises are dangerous. So contact sports or any sports that involve risk of trauma to the abdomen or falls or joint stress. And one in particular is scuba diving, which can result in fetal de birth defects and fetal decompression disease. Sex isn't known to be associated with any adverse outcomes. And there are a couple of lifestyle advice things. So obviously smoking cessation, working during pregnancy if there are any specific hazards. And practical measures, things like how to use the seatbelt correctly in a car. Next would be advice about antenatal screening and what can be expected. And I'll talk more about that in later slides. And finally, really important would be to talk through normal symptoms of pregnancy. So feeling sick, vomiting, for example, in early pregnancy is to be expected, but when to look out for problems. Heartburn, constipation, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, vaginal discharge and backache, they're all common things. In general, treatments are conservative and ideally lifestyle. So for example, 
for vomiting, a non-pharmacological treatment that could be given as ginger. But if medication is needed, then there are options. So on to that second part of the first appointment, which is the booking appointment, which would normally be done by the community midwife. One of the main points of this is to identify the pregnancy care pathway that the woman will be put onto. And I talked about some of the risks associated with uh, pregnancy and which pathway that might mean women go into earlier. Other things, so you discuss the ideal place of birth. At this point, more discussions take place about screening options and what's, come, what's to come in terms of antenatal care. But in terms of this initial appointment, as well as talking about what is possible, you can offer some screenings. And that would be things like blood group, rhesus D, screening for hemoglobinopathies, anemia, hepatitis B, HIV, syphilis, chlamydia testing, and gestational diabetes and pre eclampsia using chance factors, which is a scoring system. You can also offer appointments for future screening. So this would include um, your ultrasound screening for structural anomalies, for example. One of the important things in the booking appointment is to create an environment where you can talk about FGM or female genital mutilation and identify women who may have had genital mutilation. And then ask about past or present severe mental illness or psychiatric treatment, how their mood is, and also occupations to identify any potential risks. In terms of examination, if during the history you were concerned about FGM, you would then ask if you could do an examination. Do you height and weight to record BMI, blood pressure and proteinuria, and a urine dip to detect asymptomatic bacteria in the urine. Again, lots of advice in this appointment. So, for example, how the baby will develop, antenatal classes, breastfeeding workshops, and then specific things like toxoplasmosis prevention measures um, and toxoplasmosis finding cat feces. Nutrition and diet, so things like the Healthy Start vouchers for those who qualify. And this is where each week the woman receives vouchers to spend on milk, fruit, vegetables and infant formula milk. And pelvic floor exercises as well. So that was quite a lot of information. So really the last bit in this section is just about late bookers. So ideally that initial appointment and the booking appointment is done before 10 weeks, but that's not realistic for all women. And more than 20% of women first see a medical professional after 12 weeks. And it, so these women would then be called late bookers. And there are a number of reasons for that. So for example, single parents or women that have reduced mental capacity or difficulties accessing healthcare. These all tend to be late bookers. And there's a few more on there that are listed for you to read through. So back to the schedule. So that was the booking appointment, which is really the first heaviest appointment. And then going on from this, these tend to be quicker appointments. And I just listed each one. So between 10 and 20 weeks is a routine anomaly scan. And I'll, I'll talk about the scans and further screening in a minute. 28 weeks is screening for anemias and rhesus D, atypical red cell and aloe antibodies. And you would give rhesus D at 28 weeks if it was needed. Sorry, anti rhesus tea. At 36 weeks or before, again, this is a, an appointment with lots of information giving. So this is preparing for the new baby to give information on breastfeeding, on the birth plan, labour information, things like how to deal with pain, what, what pain relief would they like, how to care for the new baby and what tests to expect as part of the new, newborn screening tests. These are vitamin K, and also looking after, mum looking after herself, so things like baby blues and postnatal depression. At 36 weeks or later, this is when you start looking at fetal presentation. So fetal presentation by abdominal palpation at 36 weeks or later. Before 36 weeks it shouldn't be done as it's not always accurate and it can be uncomfortable for mum. If on this palpation you suspect malpren present mal presentation you should go for an ultrasound assessment and then at 38 weeks you look at options for managing longer pregnancies 
41 weeks, you offer a vaginal examination for a membra membrane sweep prior to IUL which, or induction of labour. And it, the baby's now overdue and by 42 weeks, women who decline induction of labour should be offered increased monitoring. And that increased monitoring would be at least twice weekly CTG or cardiotocopram, and somebody will talk about that later, and ultrasound to estimate the amniotic fluid pool depth, which is a sign of how well baby's doing. So that's the end of antenatal care. Well, or oh, principles of antenatal care and an overview of antenatal care. Now I'm just going to go on and summarise some of the antenatal screenings that can take place. So these appointments, appointments are in addition to the routine schedule that I just talked about. And the aim of this screening is to ensure women can identify risks and get help when it's needed or when it's wanted. It's important to remember the aim of screening is to ensure informed choice, confidentiality and respect for autonomy. Screen is not perfect, it's not a diagnosis, but it does highlight or flag up women and fetuses that might be at risk and it offers diagnostic testing if available or appropriate. There are a number of screening options and in general, at all appointments, this list should be screened for. So, blood pressure and urine analysis. And for, for that, so you're looking for protein in the urine, asymptomatic bacteriuria or infection in the urine, and midstream urine culture. The reason for this is that it ultimately reduces the risk of pyelonephritis. It's important to create a setting where women feel comfortable to talk about things like domestic violence and mental health, and that's really important for each appointment as obviously these things can change. And finally, fetal growth and wellbeing should be checked. So symptoms of frontal height can be checked at each appointment from 24 weeks and from 36 weeks fetal presentation. This should be done, as I just talked about, by abdominal pal uh, palpation. Before 36 weeks, it shouldn't be done just as it's uncomfortable. And as I said, if a male presentation is suspected, the mum should go forward for ultrasound assessment. So in addition to these screening things that should happen at every appointment, there's additional screening options that women can go through if they'd like to. So in terms of additional appointments, I just, just quickly want to mention about the different pathways. So in terms of ladies on the high-risk pathway, their additional appointments would be tailored to their needs and tailored to the patient. There is increased, increased surveillance on this pathway, but the type of appointments that are needed depending on the underlying condition. But one example might be placenta previa, and most low-lying placenta, most low-lying placentas are detected on the routine anomaly scan, and most are resolved by the time the baby's born. But if the placenta extends over the internal cervical os, the, bit, the mum should be offered another transabdominal scan at 32 weeks. So that would put an another, another appointment into this list. On the low risk pathway, the following are routinely offered with the aim of incorporating them into the schedule appointments that I just mentioned. And they are a Dayton scan, an anomaly scan, or an anaploidy screen. Okay, so to start, the dating scan. So the idea of the dating scan is to confirm viability of the pregnancy and fetus, the gestational age, to see if there are multiple pregnancies and to allow accurate assessment of how, uh, how many pregnancies and sex there are. It tends to occur between 10 and 14 weeks. And at this point, if a fetus comes up a small for gestational age, an umbilical artery doctor can be used to distinguish, help distinguish between a fetus that's small and coping and one that's beginning to decompensate. It's an ultrasound scan and this just shows crown rump measurement. So you can see, see those arrows there on the image. And if crown rump length is above 84 millimetres, it's not accurate, so then you'd use head circumference. With all ultrasound scans, there are limitations. So, for example, in high BMI patients, the position of the fetus, 
Um, and detection rates vary depending on what exactly you're looking for. The second that's offered is the anomaly scan, which is done at 18 to 22 weeks. And this detects structural malformations. So I've listed a few things that it looks at there. So for example, skull shape and the internal structures. So this would look at the nuchal fold, spine, abdomen, arms, legs, the heart. It also picks up on some lethal anomalies. So for example, an encephalopathy, encephalopathy um, which means no skull or cerebral cortex, underdeveloped kidneys, major heart problems, and it can also pick on some markers of genetic disease. The aim of the anomaly scan is to give the woman reproductive choice or prepare parents to manage a birth in a specialist centre and just generally to prepare for their baby. Okay, so on to anaploidy screening. So this screens in particular for trisomy, so trisomy 21 or Downs, 18 or Edwards, 13 Pratow's syndromes. So this screening estimates the risk of aneuploidy using a number of factors. And different factors are used at different time points. And they give an estimate of the risk that the fetus shows aneuploidy. So the most ideal is in the first trimester, and that would be the combined test. This combines nuchal translucency, beta HCG, and PAP A, which is pregnancy associated plasma protein A. And in this test, if a risk of one in 150 or less appears, this would suggest it's high risk. And the result can be confirmed with a non-invasive prenatal testing or NIPT test and that looks for fetal DNA within maternal blood. In the second trimester, so this might be for example with late presenting pregnancies or if nuchal translucency wasn't possible in the first scan, then the quadruple test is done and this is done between 15 and 20 weeks. And this looks for four things, unsurprisingly, and that is AFP, or alpha feta protein, UE3, or unconjugated estriol, beta HCG, or inhibin A. This also gives a risk score, and from this risk score, the woman can decide if she wants a definitive test. Definitive tests would be chorionic filler sampling or amniocentesis, which I'll just talk about in the next slides. So where does the combined test or the quadruple test give a risk score? Chronic, chorionic venous sampling and amniocentesis are thought to give more definitive diagnoses, although they obviously aren't 100%. So chorionic villus sampling or biopsy is done between 10 and 13 weeks. And a placenta sample is taken by transabdominal or transcervical approach. And so you can see in this image that um, the sampler, I'm not, I'm not sure what the sample is that they use, but the biopsy is taken through the cervix onto the chorionic villi. There are some risks. Um, oh, sorry, I should just say that sample that's taken is then karyotyped or the chromosomes are mapped and looked at to see if there's any trisomy present. There is a risk with both of these. So with CVS, the risk is miscarriage. And the excess rate is 1% to 2%. As with any invasive technique, there's an infection risk. And there's also a risk of false positives due to placental mosaicism. mosaicism. <laughs> um, and that's sort of occurring about 1% of samples. Amniocentesis on the right hand side. So this is where amniotic fluid is aspirated. And the amniotic fluid contains fetal cells that are shed from the skin and gut. Again, these are karyotyped to look for trisomy or chromosomal anomalies. And the small needle is um, used transabdominally, and you can see in that image there, and it's put in under ultrasound guidance. And part of the reason for that is because it needs to not go through the placenta. Amniocentesis can be done from 16 weeks, so at a later time point in the pregnancy. 
But again, there are risks. So there is a miscarriage risk, although it's lower than with CVS. And with amniocentesis, as well as karyotyping, you can also diagnose fetal infections. So I just wanted to summarise antenatal screening. Screening for the mum is on the left-hand side there. And then on the right, we've got fetal screening. I've just highlighted in blue some key things. So the dating scan between 10 and 14 weeks, the anomaly scan and the aneuploidy screening. These are screening, so as I just mentioned, the difference is test to CVS and amniocentesis. The high-risk pathways tailored to the patient. And there's no evidence of benefit in routine care for a number of things. And when I say routine care, I mean in the low-risk pathway. And those things are listed there. So this would be things like auscultation of the fetal heart, routine monitoring of fetal movements, although women should contact their midwife or hospital if they notice a reduction in fetal movements. Routine use of cardiotocography or CTG. The routine use of Doppler ultrasound isn't recommended in low risk pregnancies. And ultrasound assessment in the third trimester also isn't recommended. So that comes to the end of antenatal care. And then my last few slides are just about termination of pregnancy or TOP. Um, these slides, I'm sorry, are very dry and just a lot of text. Um, I've tried to summarise some of the main information for GOP there, so hopefully there are some use. So these are just legal considerations, and this, they are the Abortion Act of 1967, which defines when a termination could take place. There are five criteria, and I found it quite interesting that the, the two top criteria, so A and B, only one doctor needs to sign. And also there isn't a time limit on A and B either. So there isn't a gestational age at which these um, terminations can be done in some. A and B are meant more for emergencies, whereas C, D and E are more socioeconomic grounds or fetal anomaly grounds. There are certificates that have to be signed, normally by two doctors, but like I said, if there's an emergency for clause A and B, just one doctor can sign. And the chief medical officer has to be informed of a TOP within 14 days. In the UK, legally, doctors must perform TOPs. And although, according to clause A and B, terminations can be carried out at more than 24 weeks, this can't be done in an NHS hospital. Quick note on terminology. A fetus born at more than or equal to 24 weeks is considered stillborn. Less than this is miscarriage. Sorry, this is if, if born dead. If there are signs of life, but then the baby dies, the death certificate must be done. And these are just two of the forms. They're just one page forms. These are legal considerations for women less than 16 years, and it largely relates to contraception, but it's thought to also apply to other medical um, interventions. So Gillett competent means that children under the age of 16 can consent to medical treatment if they've got maturity and judgment to do so. And Fraser guidelines is an addition to this. And as I said, it, it was mainly applied in terms of offering contraceptive services but it also includes termination of pregnancy. So that's, that's those um, legal considerations are just for reference, really, just summarised my understanding of them. Feticide, another note on terminology. It's recommended in TOPs later than 21 weeks and six days. And the process is that 3 mils of intracardiac 15% potassium chloride is injected into ventricles, and it's this that stops the heart. This can be given with or without anaesthesia and muscle relax. And ultrasound is used to confirm asystole. It's just worth saying here that neuroanatomically and physiologically, the connections between the periphery and cortex are not thought to be established until after 24 weeks. And the cortex is considered to be needed in order to perceive pain. Before termination of pregnancy, 
The woman should be offered counselling and support, both written and verbal information that she can take away with her. Ultrasounds used to confirm the gestation and identify any ectopics or non-viable pregnancies. Screening should be done for STIs and particularly chlamydia. And antibiotics given prophylactically. Contraception should be discussed and offered, particularly as long-acting reversible methods, such as the IUD, can be inserted at the same time. And if the woman's rhesus neg negative and not sensitised rhesus negative, she needs anti-D following the TOP, and that's regardless of what method of TOP is used or the gestational age. Bloods need to be carried out, and as with most patients, VT risk assessment. There are two main approaches to TOP, and that's surgical and medical. And the choice, the, whether medical or surgical is used, and which type of surgical depends not only on gestational age, gestational age, but also on the woman's choice. For both, analgesia and pain relief should be given. Pain relief should be NSAIDs and possibly opioids, but paracetamol isn't recommended as it's been shown as not having any better pain relief than a placebo. After 21 weeks and 6 days, feet aside, as I just described, is advised. And a pregnancy test should be taken 2 to 3 weeks after to confirm TOP. So I'm just going to summarise the medical side of things on this slide and then surgical on the next slide. So as of 2018, medical TOP can be taken at home. And before the reason for this is that women frequently before this took the medication in the hospital and then ended up bleeding on their way home. So two medications are involved. <coughs> the first is an antiprogestogen. This blocks the effects of progesterone and makes the cervix easier to dilate and promotes uterine contractions. Sorry, it promotes uterine contractions when exposed to prostaglandins. So then you would give prostaglandin analogues and these mimic prostaglandins, and they induce those uterine contractions and also have help soften and dilate the cervix. An example of an antiprogestin is mifepristone, and an example of a prostaglandin analogue is misoprostol. With misoprostol, subsequent doses are often required at later gestations, and it's worth noting that it's potentially teratogenic. In terms of timings for medical TOP, early medical abortion, which is before nine weeks, is divided into two sections here, so less than 49 days or 59 to 63 days. And this is just in terms of um, the dosing that would be needed. So in less than 49 days, mifepristone 200 milligrams, but, and 40, 24 to 48 hours later, you would take the misoprostol 400 milligrams. Whereas between 50 and 63 days, you still take the mifepristone 200 milligrams orally first, and 24 to 48 hours later, you take the misoprostol, but this time you double the dose and you take 800 milligrams. So this is, other, this is, as I mentioned before, that as gestation increases, more mifepristone is needed. And then later TOP, so 9 to 13 weeks and more than 13 weeks, again, you take the mifepristone first, 200 milligrams, but then at a slightly later timing, so 36 to 48 hours, you take the misoprostol, 800 milligrams, and then you can take subsequent doses of 400 milligrams at three hourly intervals, and that's up to a maximum of four. So summary of surgical TOPs. Anesthesia should be used. This can be local general or conscious sedation, depending on the woman's choice. Surgical preparation or ripening or priming dilatation and evacuation, or d &E. This is done between 13 and 24 weeks. So first of all, cervical preparation. This is done especially if you think the cervix will be challenging, so for example, very young women or a gestation above 10 weeks. So misoprostol at 400 micrograms PV is used. Or osmotic dilators can be used if over 14 weeks. Mechanical cervical dilators are then used at increasing sizes. And it's because of these mechanical dilators and the possible trauma they can cause that, prepar that cervical preparation is required. 
And then finally, evacuation. So this can be done by a number of techniques. One is manual vacuum aspiration, or MVA. This is done at an earlier stage. Electric suction pump, again, done at less than 12 weeks. Vacuum aspiration with a large bore cannula can be done at 14 to 16 weeks. And finally, above 13 weeks, so 13 to 24 weeks, surgical forceps can be used, but only after that cervical priming. Whilst surgical forceps are being used, it's recommended that ultrasound is applied to avoid perforation. With surgical TOP, bleeding pain is less common than with medical TOP, or less severe. But as with any medical intervention, there are risks, and especially above 13 weeks, the risks include bleeding, incomplete evacuation, and perforation, and all of the other risks that are associated with any operations, such as um, infection or damage to surrounding structures. And finally, after TOP, if the patient needs anti D, that should have been given. Contraception, that should have been covered. You should check and make sure that the patient understands what symptoms to look out for. So expected symptom, symptoms, symptoms of complications, symptoms of emergencies, and also symptoms of ongoing pregnancy. And all of this advice should be given both verbally but also written so that the patient can read it in their own time at home. Follow up isn't generally required but should always be offered alongside a 24 hour telephone number. Follow up is required, sorry, for those that are undergoing medical TOP that hasn't been confirmed as successful at the time of the procedure. For women that require mental health support, they should be referred. And it's worth noting that women with unintended pregnancy are no more or less likely to suffer adverse psychological sequelae whether they've had a TOP or continue with the pregnancy. In terms of complications from least to most likely, infection, the procedure can fail. Obviously with the surgical techniques there can be trauma. With both there can be retained products of conception. Again with surgical techniques there can be uterine rupture, uterine perforation or haemorrhage. And the risk of haemorrhage is increased at over 20 weeks. So that brings me more or less to the end. We've covered Quite a lot of topics here, so subfertility, then on to antenatal care, and finally termination of pregnancy. I wanted to put a couple of references. So at the bottom there is the link to that big flow chart that I talked about that was quite useful in terms of just putting together antenatal care as a whole. Uh, GP Notebook is quite useful, and RCOG e-learning, I think you probably have to go through it anyway, but I found some of that quite useful in terms of pictures. And finally, you uh, might hear on the boards about green tops, and green tops are the guidelines that are written by the RCOG. So there's an example of one on the left here. And this is the guideline for doctors and clinical staff, and then they also do a slightly lighter green top, which is for more of a lay audience. So thank you very much for listening. And... That's all from me.